Hello, John Serrano here, pastor of the First Baptist Church, coming your way with a message that we again pray will be a blessing and a help to you. Been talking about revival the last few sessions and I uh, want to continue with that. Um, there's a lot of talk about revival, there always is, and, and uh, there's all kinds of ways of describing and defining revival, and, uh, but there is one sure way to know what real revival is, and that's to read history. Just read the history of the church, and um, there are many books about the history of the church, and many wonderful, clear, uh, complete ref references and records of the great outpourings of God's Spirit uh, through history, especially since the time of the Reformation uh, in the 50, early 1500s. And uh, the Reformation itself was a, a, a revival of, of, uh, of religion in, in the true sense uh, of uh, the gospel being rediscovered as the gospel of the grace of God, not by works, but faith alone and the the word of god alone and christ alone and not all the other things that uh, the medieval church had added so the the reformation was a refreshing move of god and when the gospel was broken loose and uh as god would have it the printing press had just been invented a um, few few decades before uh, the early days of the reformation and so the Word of God was printed, and the messages were printed and spread all over, and, and the Holy Spirit just saved probably hundreds and thousands, and who knows, even maybe millions of people uh, who, who came to know really know Christ, which does not mean that no one knew Christ before the Reformation. All through the uh, years of the medieval church, there were bursts of God's light here and there, uh, the monastic movement at first was a, a beautiful thing with uh, evangelists going out and preaching. And and so the the Word of God was never bound, but it was almost drowned, if we could put it that way, in ritual and, and uh, false beliefs and so forth, just traditional things that uh, eclipsed the truth of the gospel. Well, the Reformation was going back to uh, the basics. Uh, they began to make the main thing the main thing, and and uh, it transformed history totally. And uh, we don't know where we'd be if it hadn't been for that. The Reformation, the Renaissance, also of course was the secular uh, awakening uh, to knowledge and so forth, and that was going on around the same time. So God was working and blessing, and and uh, but since then. As I mentioned last time, there have been these ups and downs. Well, not just since then, but from the beginning, even through Israel, there have been ups and downs, ups and downs, and in terms of, of God's power and blessing and his people shining and being obedient and, and effective, and then times of the decline when, when the church was innocuous and maybe mixed with idolatry and carnal and worldly and, uh, and lost its power and lost its influence on hearts and lives. And then that's about the time God began to move and work again and again and again all through history. Well, I want to talk about the time since the Reformation. And uh, let me just read you something I wrote. And um, it says, throughout, throughout the dismal history of man, the church has frequently experienced periods of decline. That's what we talk about, the up and down. But God's undeserved, but by God's undeserved mercy, those dark intervals were periodically followed by times of powerful spiritual renewal. Powerful spiritual renewal. It's amazing. Now, when you study this, and you understand it, you know, all you have to do is be able to read. And if you read enough of it and understand it and read the right writings about it, there are plenty of negatives, but they're more or less lost in the shuffle. If you get into the right area or you get the true history of these revivals, you will find that the times of powerful renewal were strictly and absolutely supernatural. That's the thing that, that the church today seems to have lost sight of. We, we, we live in the natural, 
and the church depends on natural things. We try to show the world how hip we are, and we can imitate their music, and we can entertain, and our preachers give you all the psycho babble about how to have a better family, how to have a better life. I'm not saying those things are wrong. They're, most of the time it's okay. Some of them are goofed up, but, but the point is there, there is the main thing, and the main thing is in God's mind, that's what counts. It's not what we think is the main thing. We might have a hundred main things any time, and the church is famous for that. We get off on every tangent that's possible. But the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And what is it? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he's talking about eternally lost. He's talking about people losing out on God's plan for humanity, which is to share his glory forever, to be recreated in his image and likeness spiritually and eternally with eternal life. That's what God's doing. That's invisible to the world. The Bible says the world can't see it. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness to him, neither can he understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. So you don't expect the world to understand that. They think, oh well, religion, it helps uh, people not be nicer to each other, feed the poor, blah, 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 all the good things that, all the good byproducts of the real thing, which is to see individuals born again by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus' thing, not mine. That's what Jesus said. He said, you must be born again. And that's a big deal. Yeah, nothing else will take its place. And when we lose sight of that, I know preachers talk about, you know, coming to Christ and trusting Jesus and, and asking him into your life and blah, blah, blah. And all that's okay, but, but there's a message that is crystal clear and powerful. And, and it's, it's spelled out in God's Word. No pastor, preacher, evangelist, missionary has any business changing it, watering it down, shifting the emphasis. Uh, the, the, the message is clear. What is it? Repent. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent means a willingness to turn from your own life, your own will, your own values, your own carnal desires, for a turn from any sin, willing, not able. You're certainly not able. Nobody's able without the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And even those who come to Christ struggle, of course. But there has to be that heart willingness that and that and the bible repentance means a change of mind i change my thoughts about god about eternity about jesus about the cross about my sin about my position before god and i do it i change it from my views and the opinions of the world and all the false teachings and i put it in line with a pure simple message of christ in the bible and that is that individuals are lost, they're blind, they're deaf, they're dumb, they're, they're dead spiritually, even though they might be highly intellectual, greatly talented, beautiful, powerful, rich, wonderful, celeb they may be all the wonderful things the world worships, and yet in their spirit they don't know God. That's all there is to it. They can talk about God, but they don't know him. They have not been reborn by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That's real. And, and it's not necessarily a great emotional experience. It's not necessarily some sort of feeling. It is a fact of, of, of that, that begins when the heart turns to the Lord and he removes the veil from your eyes and suddenly you know that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. He did what he said he did. He did what the Bible said he did. It's all real. It's fact. Nobody's ever proved one line of it false. Never one line has been proven false in the Bible. You hear a lot of people doubt it, don't believe it, laugh at it, blah, blah. But give me the proof. See, nobody, there's not one shred of empirical proof that the book of God is not exactly the way God designed it. Men wrote it. They had all kinds of different views and different ideas and so forth and different styles. But it comes out, the clear message of Christ died on the cross for our sins. 
and we must surrender to him and receive him because God is God and we're not and we and as long as we live in our own lives we're living like we're our own God and it doesn't work because we're dependent on him for every breath every heartbeat every life life moment it is a gift from God and we owe him everything and he in mercy created us he in mercy keeps us alive he in mercy gives us this fantastic creation even though it's fallen because of man's sin so the lord jesus gives us the clear simple message repent he, that was what he preached jesus preached it john the baptist preached it all the disciples and all the faithful pastors uh, through the years preach repentance now you say, I never heard my preacher say repentance. Well, that's a problem. It really is. Repentance means turning from your sin, being willing to let God make you perfect. You say, am I going to be perfect? No, <laughs> but he's going to move you in that direction. And I love that saying, um, Vince Lombardi, who went to be, uh, you know, some of you have heard this a hundred times, but, but Vince Lombardi went to be the coach of the uh, poor, benighted Green Bay Packers who were last on the list in, the, in professional football. And, and he went there, and the first thing he said to these losers was, he said, we are going to settle for nothing less than perfection. And, of course, they just rolled their eyes. And he said, but we won't reach perfection, but in reaching for perfection, we will attain excellence. That's a great thought. I don't know if it's original with him, but it is a great thought, perfect for Christians. We don't settle for anything less than to be 100% like Jesus. I'm not satisfied fully unless I'm moving in that direction. Now, I'm not going to be frustrated and upset because I'm not perfect. That's ridiculous. No, we know we have our battles and our weaknesses, but in my heart, I want to be perfect. I want to please my Savior. I want to please the one who died for me. Like Paul said, it's personal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's you and Jesus, see? And, and that's exactly what Paul said. He said, he said, I, 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 I live, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's old hard Pharisee who became a, a, the greatest evangelist in history and a missionary, and he, he, here he says, he, he loved me, and he gave his life for me. Can you imagine? This is a guy who tried to kill Christians, who, who, wanted, who voted to stone Stephen, who uh, hauled them off to jail. And when he found this experience of being born again, uh, he loved Jesus. And he didn't see him. He never saw Jesus uh, in this world except on his vision uh, in the you know, on the road to Damascus, he saw the light of Christ. But, but as far as Jesus, humanly speaking, he didn't see him in his lifetime. He came after. But when he did, he, he, he knew Jesus. Uh, he loved me and gave himself for me. He wasn't ashamed to make it personal. It wasn't selfish. It was a fact. And it's a fact for you if you've accepted Christ. If you said, Lord, I'm willing to be what you want me to be. I really don't want to sin. I want to be a good believer, a Christian. I want to be a, a witness for you. I want to love and have joy and peace. And I want to be like Jesus. If that's in your heart, he is with you. He loves you and gave himself for you. And personally, one-on-one, -on -one, he's interested in each one of us one-on-one. -on -one. And it's the one God in Christ by the Holy Spirit in you and with you. I can't emphasize that enough, and I do emphasize it a lot. So, the point is this. When, uh, in history, the church gets into a slump, 
which I believe it's in right now, in the West. Now, the rest of the world, God is pouring out his spirit. People are being saved. There's miracles. Uh, uh, we don't hear about it in the secular news, but God is moving all over the world, even in China, where they're bulldozing their churches, and in India, where they're trying to get rid of Christianity. The Hindus want to exterminate Christianity, and the Muslims, by the way, which has brought those two together, which is not bad, because the Christians can <laughs> witness to the Muslims. But but the point is, uh, in the Middle East, of course, they want to you know they want to kill every Christian and every non-Muslim. Uh, not all the Muslims are that way, but you know the terrorists and so forth. So so Christianity is up against it all over the world. But the God is moving in a mighty way, and people are coming to Christ by the hundreds and thousands all over the world. But that's scary because in America, it's barren. It's dry, it's slow, it's tedious, and, and, and it's a weird mixture of, of the Americanized version of Christianity with prosperity and healing, which is great, uh, fine in itself, but, but when it becomes the main thing, then there's trouble. And uh, social do-goodism, you know, helping the oh, homeless, doing all these, all those things are good. But the good becomes the enemy of the best when it eclipses the main thing. Okay, so when revival comes, we, number one, get back to the main thing. And the main thing is the felt presence of Christ that transforms individuals and makes them strong in Christ. Not weakling, whiny, whooshy Christians, which is what we got a bunch of today. But we want Christians that are strong. We're called soldiers in the Bible. We're called soldiers. Uh, we're like farmers. They work hard. And uh, the Bible gives these pictures of Christians being victorious and um, in, a, in spite of everything. So this is what, when revival comes, so this is what we want God to do, and he must do it. And in history, it was always God who did it. And, and things happened to individuals and churches and communities that were beyond human explanation. And, and I'm going to share some of that with you. Uh, in, in the today, maybe if I have a couple, no, I'm not today, but, but tomorrow, about how God, when he comes, it's supernatural. Now, see, today we're so used to not seeing that mighty power of God that we, we take what we have and, and it's good enough. I can't believe it. I can't believe any pastor who's, who's worth his ministry is satisfied. No way in this world. Now you say, oh, those guys have those mega churches. No, even I've heard some from some of them, and they're not satisfied. You know why? Because they, they see all these thousands of people, but, but they have, when they have home meetings, there's only a few that are interested. Prayer meetings, forget it. See, everybody's a, a, a spectator. Come for the show. Hear the preaching and all that. And, and I hear these guys who are sincere, and they lament that. In fact, one of them, uh, Francis Chan, quit and left. He said they talk more about me than they do Jesus. And he gave up his mega church, and now he's in Hong Kong, uh, being a missionary. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying any other pastors need to do that. You do what God tells you to do. But, but any pastor today worth his salt is going to say, "I want more. I need more." And I'm going to end with this. In 1857, God poured out his spirit in an amazing, miraculous way in the United States. And I'm going to talk about that next time. I'll give you the, all the details. It's beautiful what happened. It started with a prayer meeting on, on, uh, on near Wall Street in New York and spread all over the country. And then, and, but in, that happened in 57. In 57. Well, then... Uh, uh, um, Bre uh, the pastor uh, uh, in in London, uh, Spurgeon, heard about it, and and he was preaching to thousands of people, but he knew there was something missing, there wasn't the spirit and the power, and 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 uh, one of his friends came to him, one of his men came to him and said, "Oh, pastor, we're so thankful for the way you, God is blessing our church, but there needs to be more. We need the revival." 
and and he said, "Yes, I, I feel that." And this, the same time, a few days later, or the same day, another one came to him and said, oh, "I can't stop praying for revival. I can't stop praying." And and he said, "It's coming. It's coming. If I have a few people like that who are praying, it's coming." And sure enough. And it, it happened here in 57, 1850, in 1859, God poured out his spirit uh, on England and uh, all over the place. And, 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 and it was totally supernatural. It was, you, you, you see, now, now he, he could have been satisfied. He had the crowds. He had the people. He had adulation. He had some people getting saved now and then. But he knew there was more. And God always has more. And he's got more for us. Believe me, he's got more for us. And it's hanging like a great cloud over us. And we need to pray that he'll release his power upon his church today in our time here in America. So that's my challenge to you today. We'll talk about more about this uh, next time. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for what you have done in history. And it's nothing more than what you've done for each one of us who know you. You've just transformed us. We thank you. We want that to come with mighty power upon us again afresh and then reach out to many, bring many to Christ. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.